Well, we've been going through this uh, Fearless Faith series, and, you know, faith is trust and dependence on God. And uh, we know God, of course, through the person of Jesus Christ. He says that he had fully revealed who God is, that if we, we know Jesus, that we know God. And, and we know that fear comes in all of our lives. And sometimes at times we least expect it, and we really can't avoid fear, but, but living in fear letting it reside there really prevents our faith and when we find ourselves afraid or if we're worried and under a lot of stress and anxious um, the the optimal desire is that we would recognize that the fear means that that we have slipped from faith and that we need to acknowledge that and return back to that source fear is that alarm fear um, then is replaced by by that trust in God, trust in His provision. And over and over, God says in Scripture, do not fear, do not be afraid, take courage, I am with you, okay? Don't worry about this, Jesus says. God's going to take care of you, don't don't be afraid. And yet the reality is, is that um, all Christians encounter fear. We have times when our faith now, it doesn't seem strong, and at best, it's time when our faith is very low, or so we think. Now, today we get into the topic of fear being tested. And, and maybe, I don't know, maybe you are going through a time of testing right now, a season where it seems like just everything is going wrong. No matter what you do, it just doesn't turn out right. And you know, I want to say, first of all, that everybody has those seasons. You're not unique. Okay, It, it happens to all of us. Maybe right now you just don't feel close to God. I mean, let's be honest about this. Let's own this. There are times in life where we just don't feel close to God at all, and we don't know why, and we try to repair that, and it, sometimes it just doesn't work. And maybe you had things put in kind of a nice little outline of how things are, and then you know maybe some bad things happen to some good people, maybe you, or maybe some good things happen to some bad people, and you go, you know, this is just kind of messed up and the world isn't the way I thought it was. And, and, you know, a lot of times when we get in that kind of situation, we go through that kind of season, we go from I don't understand to I don't care. And that's just a dangerous step to go from I don't understand to I don't care. Now, I first want to touch on a false expectation that we seem to naturally have and the false expectation is voiced in a common phrase that's meant to encourage us and the phrase is God will not give you more than you can handle how many times have we said that somebody you know somebody comes in and they go oh my life's a mess I you know and, and we try to encourage them going well God will not give you more than you can handle and they go oh yeah right and the whole perky and life's just real good right it just fixes everything. It sounds so good. It sounds so right. Not God will not give you more than you can handle. It's encouraging. We believe that no matter what we face, I can handle it. I've got optimism now. And boy, I was kind of depressed there. But now they've cheered me up and my confidence is going to rise. And I'm going to go out there and get them today, you know. Golly gee. <laughs> you know. I'm going to change my attitude and get through this rough patch and that's going to go away and things will return to sweet comfort with no problems. You know, just life is just sunshine and butterflies, rainbows. Well, let me ask you something right now. Have you ever, do you ever remember life when there were no problems? I was thinking about this when I was doing this. I think the last time I remember life when I had no stress, no problems whatsoever, I think I was about six, <laughs> right? And I had my pony and I had my dog. And life had no problems. But since about six, I can say that almost every day there's some kind of stress, something pushing me, some kind of stress in life, you know. And this slogan that God will not give you more than you can handle, let me, let me just say outright, this is a lie. This is what we want to hear, but this is not what we need to hear because this is not reality. God is going to give you much more than you can handle. He will. God always gives people more than they can handle. I mean, Moses didn't just handle the Red Sea by himself. He kind of needed God there, right? 
Daniel would have just been lunch to the lions, right? If he if it weren't for God, uh, Goliath and David. <laughs> David says, "Yahweh will give me the victory." David didn't say, "I think I can handle this. I'm really good with the slingshot." The Bible is the story of people not being able to do it on their own. It's really the story of so many people that think that they could and then found out that they couldn't. And then God used them. And, and having the expectation that, that God is kind of filtering my life so it's always going to be comfortable without any stress, it's not real and it's really kind of dangerous. Because the purpose of the testing is so that we realize that we can't handle. So this is the new slogan. God will not give us more than he can handle. Isn't that better? What, what if somebody came in your office, you know, just life's terrible, and you go, well, God will not give you more than what he can handle. See? Doesn't that make a whole lot more sense? See, the kingdom of God has no comfort zones. There's no little areas, you know, where you get to go rest in the kingdom of God. I think I can say with certainty that we all desire to stay in a comfort zone. You'd be kind of weird if you said, I'm looking for some stress today. I'm looking for some pressure. No, we all want comfort. We want to do things we know that we can do. We want to avoid stress. We avoid anything which is uncertain. There's a little picture that's going around on Facebook. I put it in your bulletin if you've got a bulletin. We'll put it up here too. And it shows the, the two kinds of plans in life. And, and your plan, you're on your bicycle. There's just a slight incline going uphill. You can, you can handle this, right? And then there's the finish line. No bumps. Underneath, it's God's plan. And, you know, wow. Uh, the valley's filled with rocks that you're going to be riding through. And then there's this, you, you get, get through the rocks, you plant a, plant a flag up there on the, on the top of the mountain because you got through the rocks. And then uh, there's, a, there's a narrow little gorge to, to cross, but there's a, there's a bridge. You get across the bridge, kind of scared, but you plant a flag right there because I made it, you know. And then there's this deep valley with water in it, and there's a boat that you can go across, but you can also walk the tightrope on the top of it. Okay, this is God's plan. This is what your life is going to look like. And when you get across that, you plant another flag. I crossed, I crossed the valley with the water. And then the end of it is this really deep gorge where you fall down to the bottom and then you've got to climb up and it's, there's a rain cloud over that. Okay? And at the end, you plant another flag. And I think that's just a good visual picture of... God's plan for our lives that there are a lot of things that we're going to encounter that are going to be difficult and when you cross one of them you got to remember to plant that flag you got to remember to say I went across this because God took me across this there's no such thing as a comfort zone in the kingdom of God or the other saying is God comforts the afflicted and he afflicts the comfortable we should expect to be tested really should. And of the great examples of men and women of, of God, uh, they, they all become closer to God. They become more sold out for God through the pressure and the testing. Perhaps the greatest one, no doubt, was Paul. The longest story that we know of any, any man in Scripture. He's a righteous man. He always, always does what's right, and yet he endured just terrible things. I mean, Many times he was stoned. Three times he was stoned. That means he was kicked out of a Jewish synagogue three times. He was left for dead. He, he was beaten. You know, the, the man had a rough life. And this is what he said in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 to 9. He said, We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. We were crushed, overwhelmed beyond our ability. I thought I would not live through it. I expected to die. He said, but you know what happened? I learned to rely upon God. Okay? I learned to stop relying on my own skills, my own determination, my own people skills, and I learned to rely on God. That means that he had faith, that he trusted, that he depended on God. The God who raises the dead, he says. <laughs> that, that end phrase, he just kind of threw that in there. 
He says, you others may be relying on philosophers or relying on some kind of great teacher. I'm relying on the God who raises the dead. And that kind of sorts him out among everybody else, doesn't it? It's the God who raises the dead. And Paul's not the only one. In fact, every every person of faith went through some testing. James 1, 2-4. James says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Consider it all joy. Wow, I'm having a terrible day. It's a great day. It's so, so many bad things are happening to me. I can't believe it today. Everybody's against me. Everything's going wrong, right? This is going to be a great day because in this, I'm going to learn what it is to hang tough with God. To have my faith tested. That's what James says. Consider it all joy. Kind of a different outlook on life than what we have most of the time. Do you hear the reason for the testing? So that you may be perfect. And that perfect can be, um, could also be complete. It doesn't mean that you're a perfect person, but it means that you're complete in everything. Until we're tested, we're immature, we're incomplete, but stress and discomfort do something for us that we have to have. They empty us, you see, of ourselves, of our own self-abilities so God, so we can have more God and God can use us. For a time, I used to lead a Bible study on Friday nights for uh, men. There were about four, five, six men usually. Uh, And they were men who had recently been released from prison. Um, They asked me to do a Bible study with them and the the reason they wanted Friday night was because Friday night would normally be the night when they would go out and party. And so they wanted it on Friday night so they wouldn't be tempted to do that. And so we met there in the basement of the church a couple years, I think, year and a half, a couple years. Over the course of that time, I baptized a couple of them. Man, that was some of the most, thinking back on that, some of the most holy time that I've ever spent in church was with those four or five guys because boy there was there was a excuse the vernacular but there was no bull in that room I mean it was complete honesty and I used to get so worried about it about going to that Bible study because boy they could spot a phony a mile away there there was none of that you know we use kind of Christianese talk sometimes in Christian circles kind of short for things you know yeah, you know, just like we just have to give it up to God. Well, they'd, they'd blow that out of the water, you know. They 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 wanted they wanted verse. They want chapter and verse is what they wanted. And I mean, they just lived day to day. They all had addictions, um, you know, and it was just so real. And they didn't want a comfortable God. They didn't want a God that made them feel good. They wanted a savior. Because nothing in their life had ever been easy. And this wasn't e- easy any, any either. It, was, it wasn't predictable. And, you know, the question that they always ask was, can I go, God, can you help me to go one more day without my drug? God, can you, can you help me to live in such a way that I don't end up back in the joint? Okay. God, can you change me to the point where I don't sabotage my own life? to get back in the joint because I know how to do that. And they had come to the place where they had just run out of their own ability and their own, you know, tricks. And so they had just totally depended on God. And, and there was nothing that was fake and it was just shockingly real. And man, when they were angry, they were angry. And when they were happy, they were happy. And just everything was all out there. And life for them was always uncomfortable. It never was easy. And I, I think it's difficult for us who've been around the church for a while to accept that God tests us because there's this image that everyone who walks with God is just perpetually happy and has everything under control when in reality, nobody does. Nobody is perpetually happy. They're just faking it. That's all there is to it. We all have times. We all have seasons of stress. 
The reality is that when we expect God only to give us comfort and peace, we do not understand the ways of God because that's not how God does things. God, it says, disciplines his children. God leads us to the place where we are crushed, where we are overwhelmed. And through it, we learn that he is the God who raises the dead. Okay? God wants to show us how prayer works. So he leads us into seasons when we pray. He wants to give us more than we can ever imagine. Without situations in life that are beyond our ability, we would never need God. So, just a few minutes here. Couple, couple things on why we're tested because I think I think we need to understand this and and I'm not using an example of a life or a situation from the New Testament this time. I'm kind of jumping around with a bunch of scriptures because the whole counsel of God in the Bible teaches this lesson as to why we're tested. And the first one is is to protect you. God tests you to protect you. One reason that God needs to test us and put us into situations where we are aware of our need of him is that when left to our own, we begin to believe the press clippings. We begin to believe that it's me, that I really am that good. I really am that strong and that smart. I used to play golf a whole lot more than what I play anymore. I hardly play at all anymore, but I used to play just you know, I was an addict almost and, it, you know, took lessons and two or three nights a week at the driving range. And I noticed that every once in a while I would get better and I would, um, you know, learn something. And then I'd always make the mistake. And I, what I would say was, uh, I think I've got this figured out. Okay. You golfers don't, don't, don't ever say, I, th- I think I've got this figured out because you've, you've never got golf figured out. Never. You've never really got anything completely figured out. And that was like a challenge to God for me to tell God, I think I've got this golf thing figured out. And so, you know, the, the other thing that I would advise you to never say is to never say never. You know, say I'd never do that. Oh my. You'll find yourself doing that in just a matter of weeks. You know, but anyway, Paul said to the, to the Corinthians in First Corinthians ten twelve, he said, "Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall." Just about the time that we think I've got this thing conquered, you know, I think I'm really going to do great at this. Watch out, he says. When you think that you're standing firm on on your own abilities, watch out because it's then that you'll fall. And that's why God tests us is to protect us. You see, from our own pride. One of the dangers of having the blessings of God is pride. We begin to think the blessings are because of my great faith and my knowledge. We think we've got it figured out. When I graduated from seminary, uh, the first church that I went to, I was very happy to go there. It was a good church, uh, First Christian out in Versailles. And I just knew that there would be massive revival that would start in that church and spread throughout the whole United States because... Now I was there, and uh, I really knew Jesus, and they didn't know Jesus, I thought. And so, I, you know, once I told them that it, it would just be they just sarcasm here, people, but they would just <laughs> really get on fire. So uh, I decided that what I would do is I was going to have this event on Pentecost Sunday, and I sent out invitations to everybody in the church, and I ordered these banners that went outside the church that uh, they were red banners with white come Holy Spirit on them and a descending dove and they hung them on that old church in front of these white pillars and stuff and everybody was going, <clears throat> you know, never had banners on our church before, but I said, oh man, people are going to come, you know, it's going to be great. and. Look forward to Pentecost Sunday so much because it's just going to be viral, you know. I named it All Together in One Place, taken from Acts 2, where it said that the disciples were all together in one place on Pentecost Sunday. And we're just going to pack the building was what was going to happen. And from that, then the, the Holy Spirit would descend. Everybody would get filled with the Spirit, and we would just be like this virus of holiness that spread across the United States was what was going on in my mind, you know. Got to that Sunday and nobody showed up, um, almost nobody. The attendance was really, really low. 
it went down instead of going up. And uh, I remember going through that whole service, flushed in the face, red. I was just humiliated, just absolutely humiliated. And you know who was doing the humiliating? God. He was the one who was humiliating me. He was humbling me. <clears throat> Pride tripped me up. Now that's happened over and over. Maybe not to that extreme, but it happens over and over. Sometimes I think God actually sends an adversary to oppose me or us because we need some humility. Because we begin to think, I've got this all figured out. We've never got it all figured out. We're always dependent upon God. We're always dependent upon Him. Here at the gathering, we should be getting close to the point where we realize that we don't have it all figured out. All right? We should be getting close to that. Be getting close to the point where God can really do something because we know we've tried this and we've tried this and we've tried this. That's God's way. It's His M.O. He reduces this to the to the point that no one will think that it's us. They'll know that it has to be God. And this is one vital reason for our testing. God uses weak vessels to display his glory. Remember, God sent Paul what was called a thorn in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10, you all know about this. Paul said, because of the exceedingly great revelations that God was giving to me, he sent me a messenger of Satan, a thorn in the flesh to torment me lest I think more highly of myself than I am, is what he said. So catch this. God's really using Paul. So what does God do? God sends a tormentor. <laughs> Allows Satan to come and torment him. And we don't know what the thorn was. Probably some kind of physical problem. Because what he was teaching was that my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in your weakness, is what God was telling him. Now, our revelations aren't that great, but God's way is still the same. He humbles us so he might use us. When we are weak, he is strong. His power is completed. It's perfected in weakness. When we are powerful, he cannot use us because when we are powerful, we don't pray. We don't need God. We're getting all the glory. So if you're going through a rough time and you might be saying, okay, okay, Lord, I'm weak enough right now. I get your point. Okay, I, I understand now. God knows where that place is for you. There's a passage in Isaiah where Isaiah says, a bruised reed he will not break, and a small wick he will not extinguish. In other words, God knows just where that place is for you. Now the second thing that as to why is to prepare us. God tests us to prepare us. The word test and the incident of God testing his people to grow in their faith are most found in the narrative of the people of Israel wandering in the wilderness. That's where the testing is used over and over. The word test can mean evaluation to us, but the testing also means to prepare, to refine, to prove. And over and over it says that God was testing them. And likewise, over and over it says that they were testing God because God would provide for them and they would complain about it. They would whine about it. So they were not willing to receive his protection and his provision and his grace, but they insisted on having it their own way. But many times it says that God was testing them. Deuteronomy 8, uh, verse 2, and I've chosen verse 2 and, and 16 to give an example of this. Moses says, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And then verse 16, in the wilderness he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, and that he might test you to do good for you in the end. God's purpose is to, to test us, to prepare us, to increase our faith so that he might do greater things through us and increase his kingdom. I mean, we learn that as we grow through times of stress and difficulty. In exercise, we, we know that we, we have to exercise to become stronger. And the old saying is no pain, no gain 
you have to literally kind of tear those muscles, you know, for them to get bigger and stronger. It's the same way with spiritual growth. I've never heard a person say, I'm so thankful for the last season in my life where there's been so much comfort and no stress because, because during that time when everything went so well, I grew a lot. Never, never say that, will we? But instead, what we say is, it's been a rough year, but it's been a good year. We look back on it and we say, it's been rough. It's been stressful, but I've grown in this. It's been good. Of course, for that to happen, we have to be willing to learn and grow. And that growth only happens as we receive the test that God brings our way uh, because they reveal what's in our heart. Jewish psychiatrist Viktor Frankl um, was a man who wrote a very popular book. Uh, it's on a lot of people's top ten books in their lives, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Viktor Frankl was a Jewish psychiatrist who was arrested, arrested in World War II and uh, lost all of his property, all his family, all his possessions. He was working on a manuscript psychiatrist is working on a manuscript that he had hidden in his jacket lining and when he was taken to Auschwitz they found that they took his manuscript away and he was just crushed because this was his life work this was the this was why he was living was to work on this and he was still wrestling with that a few days later when the Nazis uh, forced the prisoners to give up their clothes and he said, I had to surrender my clothes and in turn inherited the worn out rags of an inmate who had been sent to the gas chain chamber. I found in the pocket of the newly acquired coat a single page torn out of a Hebrew prayer book which contained the main Jewish prayer, the Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Frankel says, how should I have interpreted such a coincidence other than that than as a challenge to live my thoughts instead of merely putting them on paper? Later, as he reflected on his ordeal, he wrote in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he says, there's nothing in the world that would so effectively help one to survive even the worst conditions as the knowledge that there is a meaning in one's life. He who has a why to live can bear almost any how. Isn't that a great line? God was preparing him for something greater. Uh, the work of Frankel has touched millions of people. It's on my top ten list, without a doubt. And I think often that we, we live a meaning of life without being perhaps aware of what that meaning is. Uh, God is preparing us without us knowing it. And I know I look back over my life and I could see how God was putting together pieces and, and knocking off edges. Okay, God was doing a work when I was not aware that he was doing a work. And my faith was growing even though I was not aware that it was growing at the time. Next week we're going to look at doubt. How doubt bears into our faith. But to finish our work today, I've got two questions that I, I want you to take home and kind of wrestle with. And uh, these kind of help us discover, I think, what's, what God is doing now and give us confidence right now. The first one is, what has happened to me in the past that has prepared me for today? Think back to your life. So there's probably some difficult things. How has God used some difficult things in your life to prepare you for today? And the second question is, what tests or difficulties have come from God to stretch me? What is God doing to stretch you today? Well, let's listen for a moment of prayer. Let the pain and 
the soul be washed away in the waves of his mercy as deep cries out